So there's this new phenomenon uh, known as binge watching. How many binge watchers we got in here? A few. Binge watching is when you find a TV show that you like and you just watch it one show after the other after the other. For hours and even days, people do this. Because the idea is that you want to catch the whole story of a, of a season and then you want to catch the whole season and its final season. You want to catch the big ending. If you don't know what that means, just ask the Game of, Game of Throners. They'll tell you about the end of that big season. Because the ending of a story really matters. So we've been in this six-week series since Easter to now called Long Story Short. And we've been looking at the big story of the Bible. Not the little story, but the big story of the Bible. What's the big story that holds this 66-book ancient text about God and about God's people? What is the story that holds it all together? And what I want to do tonight, or this morning, is I want to take just a few minutes and, and I want us to walk through the whole Long Story Short so that you can see the whole picture. So it begins with creation. There are two creation stories in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2. Genesis 1, God's this big cosmic God who speaks uh, nothing into something. He speaks the, the earth and then at the very end speaks human beings, man and woman. He makes them in his image. Gives to them dominion and the responsibility of taking care of the creation. There's a second creation story that's in a garden. And God's not cosmic this time. God is much more, well, he's much more like a potter who shapes Adam from dust and he's much more like a surgeon who cuts Adam in half and splits the original Adam and makes Eve. And it's in the creation story, both the first and the second creation stories, the one thing that screams is that God saved the best for last when he made human beings in his image and with his breath. But the story uh, begins to go sideways, gets a little wonky, in Genesis chapter 3 when we learn about the fall. And the fall is when Adam and Eve choose their own way. Because you see, birds are made with instincts. They fly, fish, swim. But human beings are the only thing of God's creation that are given the gift of free will and choice. And they choose their own way. They get selfish and they choose their own way. They don't trust God. They don't believe God. And we learn in the fall story, we, we learn that it wasn't just Adam and Eve who fell, but it's us who are falling. Can I get a yes on that? Yeah. That all of us are fallen. But then um, God doesn't give up on his fallen creation. You see, God wants to raise up a people. And in the third episode, we learn about uh, the people known as Israel. You see, God tapped a, an old man and an old woman, Abram and Sarai, and told them that they would be the mother and father of a great nation named Israel. And, and, and God told them that he wanted them to be blessed so that they could be a blessing. That they would receive first from God and then give that blessing back to other people. And it started out okay for a while. And then they, Pastor West taught us that God's people, Israel, then, and I, let me just suggest now, get caught up in this cycle. It's what you read in the Bible. The, the 39 books of the Old Testament, you read uh, first about a destiny that God gives to his people. He says, I've destined you to do good things, to be a kind of people, a certain kind of people. But then um, we as human beings, we fall, we're fallen, and, and so we disobey. It moves into this second phase of disobedience. We choose our own way. But then the cycle doesn't end there because God doesn't give up on us. He, God comes and offers deliverance to his people. And you see this in the Old Testament over and over and over again. God's saying, I have something for you to do, a people for you to be. And then we don't live up to it. We disobey. But then God doesn't give up on us. He says, hey, I want to come and, and deliver you. This happens over and over and over again. But at the end of the 39 books, um, uh, God has made a promise he says that I'm going to send a rescuer. We call him the Messiah. And Jesus comes. That's the fourth episode. Jesus comes. And Jesus came when the time was, was just right. Um, look with me at your notes and on the screen at Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Paul says that when the time was just right, in the fullness of time, God the Father sent the son, the son Jesus. And Jesus came and he, he moved into our neighborhood. Uh, John says Jesus uh, became flesh and moved into our 
into our world. And so we see that through Jesus, um, that uh, in the life of Jesus, that, 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 that religion and government, well, they conspired together. They didn't like the ministry of Jesus, and they killed him. Jesus was placed in a tomb, but we know the rest of that story. We know that Jesus rose from the dead victoriously on Easter Sunday. But Jesus' ministry wasn't just about dying for your sins and my sins and raising from the dead. The story was also about, the mission of Jesus was also about establishing a people, just like Israel. And so God establishes in the fifth season, the church, the, the people of God. Pastor West beautifully taught us last week that we are the ecclesia, we are the gathered people of God that were grounded in our identity and that we soar in our influence, that our job as the church is to make the realities of heaven uh, the realities of earth. But if we're honest as the people of God, just like our forefathers and foremothers in Israel, we get caught up in that cycle of destiny and disobedience and, and deliverance. And so God has established this people called the church, and, and yet that's not the end of the story. Because the end of the story, what you binge watch to get to the end of the story is the sixth episode, which is new creation. You see, Jesus came the first time, and we call that the first advent. And Jesus is going to come back a second time. We call that the second advent, the new creation. And the Bible talks about how God, at the end of time, God is not going to burn up this planet. He's going to redeem it. He's going to remake it. He's going to restore it because this creation is God's creation, and God cares about this creation. You see, the story began in a garden, and the story ends in a garden city in the book of Revelation. John was the one that was given, well, was given this view of what the end of time would look like. And John stood on tippy-toe, if you will, and he peered into the future, and then he wrote down in a book what he saw. Listen to one of the things that he said he saw in Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 through 5. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. You ought to give a shout for that one. Can we thank God for that? That's a good promise right there. You see, this is the promise of the new creation. God's not destroying the planet. He redeems it. He fixes it. You see, the end times, no matter what you've been taught, the pages of Scripture teaches, not that God's going to burn up the planet, but that God's going to fix it. He's going to put it back to its original factory settings. And we're going to have a new body living on the new earth, worshiping God together forever. That's the promise of the new creation. No more tears, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. And those of us who follow Jesus right now, between his first coming and his second one, I want to suggest this morning, we are living in the land between. We're living in this land between, and, and how are we supposed to live in this land between? So uh, two weeks ago, the teaching team got together to talk about this message from all of the campuses of Grace Church. We got into this amazing discussion uh, about how different generations manage and navigate the craziness of our world. Now, what I'm going to share with you are kind of generalizations. You're going to find people who don't fit these categories. But in general, I think this is true. We believe this is true. Uh, there are older folks like me that are builders, boomers, or busters. If, if you're mid-50s and older, that's who you are. And, and, and we grew up with an understanding of what our responsibility was to the messed up world was we're supposed to, you know, kind of fix it ourselves. We're supposed to man up, woman up, fix the planet. We're kind of utopians. That's the word that's used. We're utopians. We, we want to we wanna fix this, this, this broken planet. We're going to work to make it a better place. The younger generations, millennials, Gen Zers, and younger, uh, my, my children and my grandchildren, they're not utopian, they're dystopian. Just look at their movies. They're about zombies, 
Apocalypse. Fortnite. Anybody played Fortnite? Man, it's an apocalyptic uh, uh, video game. You see, they see the despair of this planet and they kind of throw up their arms and say, oh, man, there's no use. It's just going to destroy itself. Let me give you an example. My mom and dad, Carmen and Hector, are 92 years old. Now, they were born on the island of Puerto Rico, dirt poor. And they moved to the United States in their early 20s, and they have lived the American dream. My mom and dad have soared in both their socioeconomics and in their social status as Americans, and they've enjoyed everything that is good about America. But my parents, they lived through the Great Depression, and they lived through uh, wars and rumors of wars, and they, they were raised that you're supposed to um, lift yourself up by your own bootstraps, by your own, your own bootstraps. Their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren now, millennials and Gen Zers, they grew up living through 9-11. That's the only thing they've ever known, the insecurity of 9-11. They, they grew up with school shootings. That's normal for them. Uh, They they grew up with cell phones and the internet. You see, for them, we get a kind of an understanding because that's the world that they grew up in. But, But listen, whether you're old like me or young like my grandkids, if you're a Christ follower, you can live different. You can live different in the land between, between trying to work it out yourself or trying to just throw up your hands in despair. So here's the question. How does a follower of Jesus live in the land between? How do we live in the land between? How are we supposed to live differently? Because, listen to me, because of the promise of God's new creation. His promise of what he's going to do. Let me suggest two things. And you fill in the blanks. Number one, live a life of peaceful anticipation. Say that with me. Live a life of peaceful anticipation. Have I told you lately that I have four beautiful grandbabies. Have I ever told you all that, lady? So Cheryl and I have four beautiful grandbabies, uh, Mia, Levi, Seth, and Zoe. And we told our grandchildren that the summer that they turned 10, they could pick anywhere in the United States and by themselves, just them and grandma and grandpa, we would take them wherever they wanted to go for a week. So two years ago, Mia, our granddaughter, turned 10, and we took her to Niagara Falls. I think here's a picture of that. She went on the Canadian side. It was a little stretch, but she, we, let her, we let her go. We went to, the, to the Niagara Falls and to Toronto. I had a great, great time. Her little brother, uh, Levi, I think there's a picture here of Levi with Lala and Drempel. And Levi turns 10 this summer. So for the last six months, we've been planning uh, his 10th birthday trip. And, uh, and he decided, because Pastor Wes has been infecting my grandkids... He decided, because he's a history buff, he's, we're going to Williamsburg and Jamestown and Washington, D.C. And uh, so I discovered uh, on my phone that there's a countdown clock. And so we set it up as the Levi 10th birthday extravaganza countdown clock. And every time I see Levi, uh, two, three times a week, he runs up and he grabs my phone. And he said, Grandpa, Grandpa, how much longer? How much longer? Here's what Levi knows. He knows the trip's coming. Time is kind of fuzzy for him. But he knows his grandpa's got it. He knows his grandpa's going to take care of him. And so he lives with peaceful anticipation. Excited, but peaceful anticipation. That's how God wants us to live. With the promise of the new creation. We don't know when it's going to happen. Somebody tells you they do, they're lying to you. They're trying to sell you something. Jesus says he's, he's got it. Jesus told parables about this. And we're we're going to actually look at three of them real quick today, all in the same uh, chapter in the Bible, Matthew chapter 25. Uh, here's the first one we want to look at. As Jesus tells us how we're supposed to live, it's this parable of the ten virgins and the bridesmaids. Let's just look at, at a few of the verses. Uh, it's on the screen. Let me read it for you. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five 
were wise enough to take along extra oil. Read this last line with me, verse 14. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the hour, day or hour of my return. So there's ten bridesmaids in this story of Jesus. Five of them are wise, five of them, Jesus says, are foolish. So you're wondering, what's the big deal about the bridesmaids and the oil and the, and the lamps? You see, in the first century in Palestine, the bride had her bridesmaids, and they were with her, and um, they would have lamps, and they would light them and escort the bride to the groom's home where they would have the wedding. But they didn't know when the time was to go to the groom's home because the parents of the bride and the parents of the groom were bartering together over the dowry. That was how much money that the groom's parents would pay to the bride's parents for their daughter's hand. Now, they don't do that anymore. Thank you, Jesus. They don't do that anymore, right? It is, by the way, just a little window into how much God loves this world. You see, God paid the ultimate dowry when he sent his son Jesus for his bride, the church. Now, not knowing when the parents would get done negotiating the dowry, the wise, the wise bridesmaids, they had plenty of oil. The unwise did not. Jesus' point is this last point. Look at verse 13 again. His point is, so you two must keep watch. You've got to keep watch for we don't know. We don't know when, when, when God's going to say, it's time to come home. He says, be ready, be prepared. You see, what you, what's kind of underneath this is that every one of us has to have our own firsthand faith. It ain't grandma's faith. It's got to be your faith. Every one of us needs to have not just a firsthand faith, but we need to have an up-to-date faith. This week I was reading um, in our daily devotional readings in the Dive Deep materials out of the book of Romans. This is not in your notes, but it is on the screen. Look at Romans chapter 8. Listen to this. And we believers, we followers of Jesus, also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of the future glory. Stop with me. Here's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, look, if you're a follower of Jesus, God's given you the gift of the Holy Spirit as just a little taste of what the new creation is going to be like. Now listen, let's continue. For we long in our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with, what's the next two words there? Eager hope, eager hope, yeah, for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies. I've asked God for a Brad Pitt body, bam, that he's promised us. We are given this hope when we are slaves, when we were saved. See, Paul wants us to know that we're living between these two advents, and God's given us this gift of the Holy Spirit. And so this week when I was journaling, on this text, here's what the Lord reminded me. 41 years ago, I was lost in my addictions to drugs and alcohol. And by the grace of God, I've been clean and sober for more than 35 years to the glory of God. And here's the deal. I never thought, listen to me, I never thought I could be free of that. And if this side of heaven is that good, can you imagine how good it's going to be on the other side? You see, the Bible wants us to know that with this kind of taste of the Holy Spirit now, that, that, that this guy who used to drink like a fish and manage drugs like a pharmacist, if he can be free now, how good's it going to be in the life to come? It says we can live with eager hope. You ever been with a kid on Christmas Eve? That's eager hope. You ever stood in line with a kid at Disney World trying to see, the, trying to see what it's going to look like on the other side to get on the ride? That's how followers of Jesus are invited to live because Jesus made a promise. Look at Revelation 22, 7. Look, I am coming soon. The next word is blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. See, Jesus says, I've made you a promise. Don't know when it's going to happen. But I am coming back a second time to establish my new creation. Not to burn up this planet, but to fix it. Now listen to me. There isn't on my phone a Jesus Returns extravaganza countdown clock. I don't know when it is, and neither do you. But here's what I do know. My daddy's got this because he made a promise. And so you and I, as followers of Jesus, we can live with, with this peaceful anticipation. There's a second way that followers of Jesus can live in this land between, and that's to live a life of kingdom 
urgency, to live a life of kingdom urgency. Now, now check it out. Peaceful anticipation, kingdom urgency. They seem to be at tension with one another, but Jesus invites us in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the gift of Christian community to manage this tension. So Jesus gives another story, another parable, right after he gives the bridesmaid parable. And it begins in verse 14. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and he entrusted his money to them while he was gone. The rest of the story goes on to say that this wealthy landowner got three of his servants and to one he gave five bags of silver. To the other he gave two bags of silver and to a third he gave one bag of silver. Let me just put that story on pause right. Jesus wants you to know that life ain't fair. Some people get five. Some people get two, some people get one. None of them earned it. So here's what Jesus would say to you if you're kind of having a little pity party because you don't have as much as somebody else. Jesus would say to you as a Christ follower, get over it. (laughs) It's up to me to determine who gets what. I want to preach like Billy Graham. And God says to me, get over it. It ain't going to happen. Okay, back to the story. Back to the story. So so the the wise, uh, the wealthy landowner gives... Five, uh, two, and one. And the guy that gets five doubles it and gets ten. The guy that's given two doubles it and has four. The guy that was given one, he buries it in the ground, doesn't do anything with it. The wealthy landowner comes back and it's accounting time. He commends the two that doubled and he condemns the one who did not. And the reason is because the wealthy landowner was generous. They didn't earn what they had been given And the one who buried it didn't use it, didn't maximize it. These are strong words from Jesus. Jesus went on to tell a third parable. Immediately following this, it's the parable of the sheep and the goats. And it says that the the shepherd's going to separate the sheep from the goats at the end of time. And listen to what Jesus says about the ones who got it right, the ones who multiplied what God had given to them. Pastor West let us look at it last week, verses 35 and 36 of Matthew 25. Uh, For I was hungry, and you, you formed a committee to talk about it. No, you fed me. I was thirsty, and, and you formed a commission. No, you, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger. You invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. You see, here's what Jesus is saying to Christ followers living in the land between. He's saying, I've given you what you didn't earn and what you didn't deserve. Now do something with it. With a sense of urgency, do something with it. Because it is in the heart of our Father for everyone to be saved. Peter was a teenage kid who heard Jesus teach these three parables. Now he's an old man, and he writes a letter to some followers of Jesus. It's his second letter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. And remember our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. You see, the Lord is patient because he wants, he's patient in his return. He lingers because The Father wants earth to be evangelized and heaven to be populated. So regardless of your age, regardless of your generation's propensity to try to work it out on your own or to try to throw up your hands in despair, God says to you and to me, as a follower of Jesus, your job, my job, is to make heaven crash to earth. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, So, uh, January 1978, I gave my life to Jesus in my parents' living room. In the spring of 1980, I was at Valencia Community College, and I heard a whisper from the Holy Spirit calling me to be a pastor. I went home and told my parents. We had a meeting at a table, and my my dad uh, uh, was in the United States Air Force, served for 25 years, and he wanted me to be a fighter pilot. And so when I told him that I was going to be a pastor, well, he was not pleased. (laughs) He was very angry. He made me give up my car. That's a whole other sermon. And, uh, And I went away to Asbury College. And the top two people I prayed for, my kingdom urgency 
was that my mom and my dad would know Jesus. So I prayed every day. And when God opened doors, I would talk to them about Jesus. And they were confused about their son wanting to be a pastor. And so um, I came home after my first year of college and married Cheryl. Uh, Took a few months off to make some money before we went back to school. And in that season that we were home, our home church, a great church like this church, had a women's retreat. And my mother went on the women's retreat. The Saturday that Cheryl was on the women's retreat, my wife Cheryl was on the women's retreat with my mother, I was at home literally on my knees before my Bible praying and asking God to save my mother when the phone rang. And I picked up the phone and Cheryl said, your mom wants to talk to you. And my mom said to me, I just gave my life to Jesus. While I was praying for mom to be saved, my mom became a Christian. So then my attention shifted towards my dad. My dad whom I had disappointed. My dad who was angry at me for not being a pilot and instead being a preacher. I began to pray for him. I graduated from college. I still prayed. In my first year of seminary, uh, my dad called. And in his late 50s, my dad gave his life to Jesus. He was baptized. He joined our church. So about a year later, and my dad's now a follower of Jesus. My mother's a follower of Jesus. I got another list of other people for a sense of kingdom urgency that I'm praying for. And my dad sent me what is one of the most prized possessions I have, a letter. And I seldom share this letter with anybody because it's way personal. But I felt a nudge from the Spirit to share it with you this morning. It's dated April 14th, 1986. My dear son, I'll always remember you with that smiling face you had on since childhood. The good times we had working under the old Buick. You with the greasy smiling face and that old GI hat on. I remember your football games and your wrestling matches and many other things. But above all, I remember when you had the call from the Lord. You left home and abandoned your promising studies of architectural engineering to go to Asbury College. Not being a Christian at the time, I felt deceived and angry. And since then, I've asked the Lord many, many times for forgiveness for acting in such a manner. By dedicating your life to your ministry and your work to the Lord, you've been an inspiration to our whole family and our friends. Now listen to this is what a military guy would write. We answered the call to the Lord and enlisted our services in his army. (laughs) And then this last line that my soul longed to hear. This last line that's a part of that's a part of Peter's promise and remember our Lord's patience. As the Bible says in Matthew 3.17, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. With all my love, dead. You see, there's an urgency that followers of Jesus have to share the love of God with people who are very far from him. That's our assignment in this space, in this land between, with a sense of kingdom urgency and peaceful anticipation to share the love of Jesus in word and in deed. Let's stand for prayer. And so, Lord, We know what it's like to live as people who see the messed up world that we live in and who are tempted to figure that we can fix it on our own or we just throw up our hands in despair. And yet we have received your promise. Promise as followers of Jesus of a new creation 
of a day that is coming. We don't know when. When there will be no more tears or sorrow or death or heartache. That sin and Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire and forever evil will be defeated. And when we will spend eternity with you. So in the meantime, help us to live with peaceful anticipation knowing that you've got this. And help us to live with a kingdom urgency. For as Jesus himself said, it is the will of God that none would be lost but that all might be saved. And so help us to listen to the prompting of your Holy Spirit And we would pray as we sing here in just a few moments, Lord, do it again. Do it again. We pray this in Jesus' name, everybody agreeing said. Amen. So we're going to sing the song. I've asked the worship team. We've got plenty of time. Don't rush off. Altar's open. If you want to pray, come down here and pray. If you need somebody to pray, you lift, lift a hand. If you've never said yes to Jesus, if today is your day, I'd love to pray with you. I'm going to be over here. Just come on over find me. Let's uh, sing together.